Howdy, howdy, my fellow gamers, and welcome to another episode of Storytime with Freak. Uh, we're only going to do one chapter tonight because i got to be up in a couple hours for work. And uh, I apologize that we didn't get an episode out on Sunday. I was out of town visiting a friend that was uh, back from being deployed overseas. And uh, it's at the place that I work at. It's our busiest week of the year, so I've just been going, going, going non-stop. I haven't even really had time to stream. Uh, we will be live on Twitch tomorrow for my 25th birthday stream slash Thanksgiving stream for uh, anybody that doesn't have family or friends to spend it with, like myself now. But uh, we'll be playing games with viewers, Super Animal Royale, Jackbox Party Pack, Rainbow Six Siege, Call of Duty Modern Warfare. We're going to be giving away a couple copies of games like Super Animal Royale, uh, 911 Operator, Sonic Mania, a couple other... <clears throat> bits and pieces, but uh, hopefully I see some of you all, and without further ado, we're going to dive further into Neil Shusterman's The Toll. A testament of the toll. A seat of mercy rested at the mouth of the Lenape, and there he would proclaim the truth of the tone. Awesome was he in his splendor, such that even the slightest whisper from his lips would peal like thunder. Those who experienced his presence were changed forever and went out in the world with new purpose, and to those who doubted, he ordered forgiveness and offered nothing. Forgiveness even for a bringer of death, for whom did he sacrifice his life in his youth only to rise again? All rejoice. Commentary of Curate Symphonius. There is no question that the toll had a grand and glorious throne, most likely made of gold, although some have poisted that it was made of gold-plated bones of the vanquished wicked of Lenape, a mythical city. Speaking of which, it is important to note that Lenap in the French language spoken by some in the ancient times means the tablecloth, thus implying that the toll set a table before his enemies. The mention here of a bringer of death refers to supernatural demons called scythes, who he redeemed from darkness. Like the toll itself, the toll could not die, so a life sacrifice would always lead to the toll's resurrection, making him unique among the people of his day. Coda's analysis of Symphonius. The key insight that Symphonius misses here is that the mention of his resting at the mouth of Lenape clearly means that the toll waited at the entrance to the city, catching those that the seething metropolis would otherwise devour. As for the Deathbringer, there is evidence to suggest that such individuals did exist, supernatural or not, and that they were indeed called scythes. Therefore, it is not far-fetched to think that the toll might have saved a scythe from his or her evil ways. And in this instance, I do, for once, agree with Symphonius that the toll was unique in the ability to return from death. For if everyone could return from death, why would we need the toll at all? <clears throat> Chapter 13. The quality of being resonant. If Grayson had anyone to thank, or blame, for becoming the toll, it was Curate Mendoza. He had been key in shaping Grayson's new image. Yes, it had been Grayson's idea to go public and let the world know that he still had a connection to the Thunderhead. But it was Mendoza who finessed the reveal. The man was a skilled strategist. Before souring on eternal life and becoming a Tonus Curate, he had worked in marketing for a soft drink company. I came up with the blue polar bear for Antarctica cool soda, he had once told Grayson. There weren't even polar bears in Antarctica, much less blue ones, so we engineered some. Now you can't even think of Antarctica without thinking of their blue bears, can you? There were many who thought that the Thunderhead was dead, that what the Tonus called the Great Resonance was the sound of it dying. Mendoza, however, offered an alternative explanation to the Tonists. The Thunderhead has been visited by the resonant spirit, he always did. The living tone has breathed life into what had once been artificial thought. It made sense if you looked through it at the lens of a tone's beliefs. The Thunderhead, all cold, hard science, had been transformed into something greater by the living tone. And as such, things often fell into groups of three. There needed to be a human element to complete the triad, and there he was. Grace and Tolliver, the one human being who spoke to the living thunder. Men Mendoza began by dropping rumors and key trigger points about the existence of a mystical figure who conversed with the Thunderhead, a Tonus prophet who was the link between the spiritual and the scientific. Grayson was dubious, but Mendoza was passionate and persuasive. Imagine it, Grayson. The Thunderhead will speak through you, and in the time the world will hang on your every word. Isn't that what the Thunderhead wants? For you to be its voice in the world? I don't exactly have a voice of thunder, Grayson pointed out. <clears throat> you can whisper, and people will still hear thunder, Mendoza told him. Trust me. Then Mendoza set out to create a more organized hierarchy to the Tonus calling that might bring together the various divergent factions, which was even easier with an individual to rally around. Mendoza, who had for many years led a quite unexamined life as the head of the monastery in Wichita, was now back in his element as a master of public relationships and branding. The toll was his new product, and there was nothing more exciting to him than the thrill of the sale, especially when it was one-of-a-kind item in a global market. All you need now is a title. Mendoza had told Grayson, one that fits with Tonus' beliefs, or at least that can be made to fit. It was Grayson who came up with the toll, and as it was actually part of his last name, it felt almost preordained. He was rather proud of himself. 
until people actually started calling him that. And to make it worse, Mendoza invented a pompous honorific referring to him as your sonority. Grayson actually had to ask the Thunderhead what it meant. From the Latin sonoritis, meaning the quality of being resonant, it told him. It has a certain ring, which made Grayson groan. People took to it, and before long everything was, yes, your sonority. No, your sonority. How am I to please you today, your sonority? It all felt strange. After all, he was no different than he had been. And yet, there he was, posing as some sort of divine sage. Next, Mendoza arranged the dramatic spot for his audiences, only one supplicant at a time, because it kept him from being overexposed and limiting access to nurture to the growing mystique. Grayson tried to draw the line at the formal ceremonial clothing that Mendoza had commissioned from some famous designer, but by then, the train had already left the station. Throughout history, the most powerful religious figures have always had distinctive clothing. So why shouldn't you, Mendoza argued. You need to look elevated and otherworldly. Otherwise, because, in a way, you are. You are unique among human beings now, Grayson. You need to dress the part. This is all a little theatrical, don't you think? Grayson commented. Ah, but the theater is the hallmark of ritual. And ritual is the touchstone of religion, Mendoza responded. Grayson thought about the scalpula that hung over his purple tunic. With all its embroidered waves, was a bit too much. But no one was laughing, and when he first began giving formal auditions to people, he was shocked by how awestruck they were. The suffocants fell to their knees, speechless before him. They trembled just to be in his presence. It turned out that Mendoza was right, looking the part sold it, and people bought it just as thoroughly as they bought blue polar bears. And so, with his legend growing, Grayson Tolliver spent his days as his sonority, the toll, consoling desperate starstruck people and passing along wise advice from the Thunderhead, except, of course, when he made shit up. You lied to him, the Thunderhead said to Grayson after his audience with the artist. I never suggested that he paint in unsanctioned places, or that he would find fulfillment in doing so. Grayson shrugged. You never said he wouldn't. The information I gave you about his life was to prove your authenticity, but lying to him undermines that. I wasn't lying, I was giving him advice. Yet you didn't wait for my input. Why? Grayson leaned back in his chair. You know me better than anyone. In fact, you know everyone better than anyone, and you can't figure out why I did it? I can, the Thunderhead said a bit pedantically. But you may want to clarify it for yourself. Grayson laughed. Okay, then. The curates see themselves as my handlers. You see me as your mouthpiece in the world. I see you as much more than that, Grayson. Do you? Because if you did, you'd allow me to have an opinion. You'd allow me to contribute. And the advice I gave today was my way of contributing. I see. Have I clarified that for myself sufficiently? Indeed, you have. And was my suggestion to him a good one? The Thunderhead paused. I will concede that giving him freedom and artistic license outside of structured boundaries may help him find fulfillment. So yes, your suggestion was a good one. So there you go. Maybe we'll start allowing me to contribute a little bit more. Grayson, said the Thunderhead. He sighed, certain that the Thunderhead was going to give him some sort of patient, long-suffering lecture for daring to have opinions, but instead the Thunderhead said, surprising. I know this hasn't been easy. I marvel at how you've grown into this position you've been thrust into. I marvel at how you've grown, period. Choosing you could not have been a more correct choice. Grayson found himself moved. Thank you, Thunderhead. I'm not sure you realize the significance of what you've accomplished, Grayson. You have taken a cult that despised technology and have caused them to embrace it, to embrace me. <coughs> the Tonus never hated you, Grayson pointed out. They hate Scythes. They were on the fence about you, but now you fit within their dogma. The Tone, the Toll, and the Thunder. Yes, the Tonus do still love their alliteration. Be careful, Grayson warned, or they'll start building temples to you and cutting out hearts in your name. Grayson almost laughed imagining it. How frustrating it would be to make human sacrifices, only to have your sacrifices return the next day with brand new hearts. There is power to their beliefs, the Thunderhead said. Yes, those beliefs could be dangerous if not properly directed and shaped, and so we shall shape them. We shall mold the Tonus into a force that can benefit humanity. Are you sure that can be done, Grayson asked? I can say with 72.4% certainty that we can wield the Tonus toward a positive end. And what about the rest? There's a 19% chance that the Tonus will do nothing of any value, the Thunder had told him, and an 8.6% chance that they will damage the world in an unpredictable way. <clears throat> the Toll's next audience was not a pleasant one. At first, there were just a few extremist zealots coming to him for an audience, but now it seemed to be true, a daily occurrence. They found ways of twisting Tonus teachings as well as misinterpreting every little thing Grayson said or did. The Toll Rising clearly did not mean people should be punished for sleeping late. His eating eggs did not imply to a fertility rate was right was called for, and a day of quiet brooding did not mean a permanent vow of silence was required. Tonists wanted so desperately to believe in something that the things they chose to believe were sometimes absurd, other times naive, and when it came to the zealots, downright terrifying. Today's extreme believer was emaciated, as if he had been on a hunger strike and had a crazed look in his eyes. He spoke about ridding the world of almonds, and all because Grayson once mentioned in passing that he didn't care for them. 
Apparently wrong ears had heard and spread the word. It turns out that that wasn't the only scheme the man had. We must strike terror into the cold hearts of scythes so they will submit to you, the zealot said. With your blessing, I will burn one of them by one, just as their rebel scythe Lucifer did. <laughs> no, absolutely not. The last thing Grayson wanted to do was antagonize Scythes. As long as he didn't get in their way, they didn't bother him and it needed to stay that way. Grayson rose from his chair and stared the man down. There won't be any killing in my name. But there must be. The tone sings to my heart and tells me so. Get out of here, Grayson demanded. You don't serve the tone or the thunder and you definitely don't serve me. Man's shock turned to contrition. He folded as if under some heavyweight. I'm sorry if I have offended you, you sonority. What can I do to earn your favor? Nothing, Grayson said. Do nothing. That will make me happy. And the zealot retreated, bowing as he walked backwards. As far as Grayson was concerned, he couldn't leave fast enough. The thunder had approved of how he had dealt with the zealot. There will always have been, always will be, those who exist on the fringe of reason, the thunder had told Grayson. They must be set straight early and often. If he started speaking to people again, maybe they wouldn't behave so desperately, Grayson dared to suggest. I realize that, the thunder had said. But a modicum of desperation is not a bad thing if it leads to the predictive soul-searching. Yeah, I know. The human race must face the consequences of its collective actions. It's what the Thunder had always told him about its silence. More than that, Grayson. Humankind must be pushed out of the nest if it is ever to grow beyond its current state. Some birds that get pushed out of the nest just die, Grayson pointed out. Yes, but for humankind, I have engineered a soft landing. It will be painful for a while, but it will build global character. Painful for them, or for you? Both, the Thunderhead replied. But my pain must not prevent me from doing the right thing. And although Grayson trusted the Thunderhead, he kept finding himself coming back to those odds at 8.6% chance that the Tonist would damage the world. Maybe the Thunderhead was okay with those odds, but Grayson found them a little troubling. After a full day of monotonous audiences, mostly with devout Tonists who wanted simplistic answers about mundane matters, he was carried off by a nondescript speedboat that had been stripped of every comfortable amenity to make it its extravagance feel suitably austere. It was flanked by two other boats, both of which bore burly Tonist armed with mortal age weapons to defend the toll should anyone try to abduct him or end him while in transit. Grayson thought the precautions were ridiculous. If there were any plots out there, the Thunderhead would thwart them, or at the very least, warn him, unless of course it wanted them to succeed. As it had for the first time, he was kidnapped. Still after that, first kidnapping, Mendoza was paranoid about it, so Grayson entertained his fears. The boat rounded the glorious southern tip of Lenop City and bounced its way up the Makiantuk River, although many still called it the Hudson, towards his residence. Grayson sat below in a small cabin, along with the nervous Tonus girl whose job it was to see whatever he might need during the journey. Each day there was someone new. It was considered a high honor to ride with the toll to his residence, a reward bestowed upon the most devout, most righteous of Tonists. Usually Grayson would try to break the ice with conversation, but it always ended up being stilted and awkward. He suspended that Mendoza was making a pathetic attempt at providing intimate companionship for the evening, because all the young Tonists who made the journey were attractive and roughly Grayson's age. It was as if Mendoza's aim, <clears throat> it failed, because Grayson never made a single advance, even when he might f have felt inclined. It would have been sort of the hypocrisy he would not abide. How could Grayson be their spiritual leader if he took advantage of the position? All sorts of people were throwing themselves at him now, to the point that it was embarrassing. And although he shied away from the ones Mendoza put in his path, he did accept occasional companionship when he felt it wasn't an abuse of his power. His greatest attraction, however, was for women who were too unsavory for their own good. It was a taste he had developed after his brief time with Purity Viveros, a murderous girl who had come to love. Things had not ended well. She was gleaned right before his eyes by Scythe Constantine. Grayson supposed seeking out others like her was his way of mourning for her, but no one found he was anywhere near Nass enough. Historically, religious figures tend to be either oversexed or celibate said Sister Astrid, a devout Tonus of the non-fanatical variety who managed his daily schedule. If you can find your happy place in between, that's the best any holy man could ask for. Astrid was perhaps the only one among those who attended him who he considered a friend, or at least could talk to like one. She was older, in her thirties, not old enough to be his mother, but perhaps an older sister or cousin, and she was never afraid to speak her mind. I believe in the tone, she had told him once, but I don't buy that what comes can't be avoided garbage. Anything can be avoided if you try hard enough. She had first come to him for an audience on what had been to the coldest day of the year, which was even colder under the arch. She was so miserable, she forgot that she was there to ask, and spent the whole time cursing the weather and the Thunderhead for not doing more about it. Then she had pointed out that the embroidered scalper layer that the toll wore over his tunic. Have you ever run that wave pattern through a sequencer to see what it spits out, she asked. Turned out a scapular was seven seconds of mortal age peace music called Bridge Over Troubled Water, which made perfect sense considering when the toll had his audiences. 
He immediately invited Astrid to be part of his inner circle, a reality check against all the crap he had to face on a daily basis. There were many days Grayson wished he was still laying low, unseen and unknown in his dark little room in the Wichita Monastery, a non-entity who had even had his name taken from him. But there was no turning back from this path now. The Thunderhead could read all of Grayson's physiology and knew that when his heart rate was elevated and knew when he was feeling stress or anxiety or joy and when he slept and knew when he was dreaming. It would not access his dreams, though. Even though everyone's waking memories were uploaded to the back brain on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, dreams were not included. It was good, discovered early on, then, that someone who needed their brain restored, either a splatter or someone who had suffered brain injury in some other way, dreams became a problem. For when their memories were returned to them, they had trouble differentiating what was real and what was the product of dreams. So now when one's mind was handed back to them in revival centers, they had every memory except for the memories of dreams. No one complained, for how can you miss something that you no longer remembered you had? And so the Thunderhead had no idea what adventures and dramas Grayson experienced in his sleep, unless he chose to confide them once he awoke. But Grayson was not one to talk much about his dreams, and it would have been too forward of the Thunderhead to ask. It did enjoy watching Grayson sleep, though, and imagining what strange things he might have been experiencing in that deep place that lacked logic and coherence, where humans struggled to find glorious shapes in the internal clouds. Even while the Thunderhead was taking care of a million different tasks around the world, it was still isolated enough of its conscience to watch Grayson sleep to feel the vibrations of his stirring, to hear his gentle breathing and sense how each breath ever so slightly increased the humidity in the room. It gave the Thunderhead peace. It gave it comfort. It was glad Grayson never ordered the Thunderhead to turn off its cameras in his private suite. He had every right to request privacy, and if asked, the Thunderhead would have to oblige. Of course, Grayson knew he was being watched. It was common knowledge that the Thunderhead was, at all times, conscious of everything its sensors were experiencing, including its cameras. But that it devoted such a large portion of its attention to the sensory devices in Grayson's quarter was a fact that it did not flaunt. For if the Thunderhead brought it to Grayson's attention, he might tell it to stop. Over the years, the Thunderhead had witnessed millions of people in each other's arms, embracing as they slept. The Thunderhead had no arms to embrace. Even so, it could feel the heat beat of Grayson's heart and the precise temperature of his body, as if it were right beside him. To lose, that would be a cause of immeasurable sorrow. And so, night after night, the Thunderhead silently monitored Grayson in every way it could, because monitoring was the closest it could come to embracing. And that is the end of chapter 13. Bit of a longer chapter and a bit of a heavier chapter. Um, <clears throat> let me know what you guys thought of it down below. We're seeing the Thunderhead become more sentient, like almost human-esque. Um, I'm really excited to see how the story continues. Uh, like I said, guys, as soon as I get through this week, I'm going to do the best I can to get back to a regular upload schedule for you. It's just holiday season, and the restaurant industry is a son of a bitch. It really is. But uh, I'm also going through a major depressive funk. So we're either going to like finish this book in the next two weeks, because I'm just going to sit here and read all day, or it might take me like six months to get through it. I don't know. I don't want to promise you anything, because you never know how it's going to happen. But... I like to uh, try to ask questions at the end of my videos to get you guys to interact, get to know each other a little bit. I like to know who's a fan of the round table. So I will ask you all this. What is something that you collect or used to collect, you know, as a child, Beanie Babies or whatever? Uh, in case you guys can't tell, I'm a very big fan of pop vinyls. I have over 340 of them. Maybe someday I'll do a video on them. But feel free to check out the links down below. Hopefully I'll see you guys in the live stream tomorrow. Uh, support the content creation dream. Happy Thanksgiving and stay freaky.